Good evening. From the Gail Lemron Auditorium on the campus of Embry-Riddle, welcome to the Embry-Riddle Speaker Series event. On behalf of the Alumni Association, welcome to Lift Off the Page. Tonight, the Commercial Space Race, a panel discussion on where we are in commercial space and where we're going. It'll be an interactive discussion with our panel, which we'll introduce to you now, and then we'll take questions from you in the assembled audience and for those of you watching us on YouTube. Diane Howard is an Assistant Professor of Commercial Space Operations at Embry-Riddle's Daytona Beach Campus and Executive Secretary of the International Institute of Space Law. She holds a PhD in International Space Law from McGill University, a Juris Doctorate in Law from Nova Southeastern University, and a Master in Air and Space Law from McGill University. Also on our panel tonight, joining us is Mariba Ja. He is an Associate Professor at the University of Texas at Austin. He holds a PhD and MS in Aerospace Engineering Sciences from the University of Colorado at Boulder, specializing in astrodynamics and statistical orbit determination, and a BS in Aerospace Engineering from Embry-Riddle's Prescott campus. Ja is a world-recognized subject matter expert in astrodynamics based space domain awareness sciences and technologies. He'll explain exactly what that is. He's been an invited lecturer and keynote speaker at 20 plus national and international space events, workshops, and uh, all around the world. Also uh, with us tonight is Sonia A. H. McMullen, Assistant Professor of College Aeronautics at Embry-Riddle's Worldwide Campus. Associate Professor Chair of the BS in Aviation Security Degree and Secretary of the World Faculty Senate. How do you get all that on a business card? That's what I want. She holds a PhD in Business Administration with specializations in Homeland Security and aero, uh, Aeronautical Science Management from North Central University, a Master of Aeronautical Science from Embry-Riddle's Worldwide Campus, and a BS in Industrial Engineering from Pennsylvania State University. Our panel tonight for the commercial space race, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, this is from Lyft Magazine. The commercial space race is on, and we're going to go to it. Much material. It would probably take multiple hours, but let's go to it to begin. Sonia, first, a lot of folks who are watching us are probably wondering, how does this affect me? Commercial space is here to stay. It's not just a pipe dream. How does it affect states and communities? Is there a financial impact to them? Oh, absolutely. Um, you, space has gone from being something that the government only did and the government only benefited to, to something that we use every day, whether we recognize it or not. You know, it, just on our cell phones alone, navigating and using uh, you know, Google Maps and, and GPS and so forth, those are all things that we use that are space. Um, but it, it permeates through the economy, not just in making space-based systems and rockets to put them there and so forth, but the products that come from that to include things like, you know, every time we talk on the phone, a lot of our television programming and, and our internet is going to go um, space-based in the not-too-distant future. So, you know, lots of products that we use um, that we're in some way, shape, or form benefiting from, including some things that we don't always recognize like you know, finding resources on the earth and, and even monitoring crops in your local community. So those are ways that, that we use space, just, just as a couple of, of examples. Dr. Howard, you've been invested in law and a career for a long time. Does this create a whole new industry? All the things that go with space, share with our audience just a few of the many things that have to be considered with commercial space expansion. Well, we'll start with Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty. So. Um, the United States is, has ratified that particular treaty. It's an international obligation, and in that treaty, Article 6 says that the states that are party to that treaty are going to be responsible for the actions of their governmental and non-governmental uh, nationals in space. So if you are going to um, embark upon a space venture, you're going to, here in the U.S., you're going to have to go through some sort of an authorization and continuing supervision uh, procedure. And those procedures vary, and they're going through some changes right now. Um, it's in flux. It's fluid. Um, so things that have been in place since 1984 um, are remaining in place, but we have new activities that are coming online. So um, Sonia mentioned a few applications, but there's other activities that are 
not really um, completely online yet, but there we're just about there. Things like on-orbit servicing and things that kind of fall to the domain that, that uh, Mariba will talk to us about. And for those activities, since there's not clear-cut jurisdiction as to which part of our government is going to exert that authorization and that continuing supervision, we'll see how that plays out. So uh, there's, a, there's a legal aspect to any commercial venture, and it's going to be through this licensing procedure. Who's likely to be the big winners in the early rollout of commercial space as it expands? Is it going to be people who want to do space travel, mining materials from asteroids and planets? And who's responsible? This is a big question for you, Mariba. Who's responsible for space junk? Because I know the audience wants to know right away, what if one of these things, like a Chinese satellite that came down last week, were to hit my house? I'm going to come back for the legal on this, but who are the big winners up front? Yeah, so um, <laughs> thanks for having me here. Listen, I mean, I think big winners are just companies all around the globe, right? I mean, starting with the US, with SpaceX, OneWeb, all these people that want to make huge profits uh, from having space-based capabilities. Space these days, it's the new kind of gold rush, the new bonanza, uh, if you will. A lot of people are saying, well, you know, if I have these satellites on orbit, People don't care so much about the satellites themselves, they care about the data, the information that these systems are collecting. And so a lot of venture capitalists and angel investors are looking at this like, well, space is just another place for me to put something that can collect a lot of information. I can couple that information with all sorts of other information like the Internet of Things, kind of aggregate this sort of thing to, I mean, we, we have recently seen you know, Zuckerberg kind of get into a little bit of hot water with the Facebook and stuff, I'm telling you, you know, be prepared, brace yourself, because when space-based information, people getting monitored all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week from stuff on orbit, is gonna be very difficult, this whole notion of privacy and these sorts of things. People are gonna be selling this information to a lot of different interested parties. So those are gonna be the people that have the most to gain from kind of uh, this freedom of being able to put uh, assets on orbit. Diane, take our audience through the legal process, too, because who's the governing body? Who makes the call on who can put what up, when, at what time, and well, is there a policing mechanism? There's no policing mechanism, no. Um, they're, you know, our treaties are much more general than that, and they rely on national law and, and domestic law to uh, really be enforced, but um, you know, it depends on what kind of activity you're talking about. So um, with regard to I, I want to go back to something that you were saying about who the big winners are. Truthfully, I believe that we're all the big winners. And, and the, the idea is that we want to perform these activities, but we want to do so responsibly. So that's where the state comes in, the government comes in. Um, now, the big question is how much regulation is enough, how much keeps it responsible, and how much is not in, how much is too much, how much is hindering innovation. So we are seeing a bonanza. We're seeing a lot of economic development. We're seeing um, profound societal goods that are being performed. I mean, some of the things that, that Sonia mentioned are, you know, like disaster management relies upon space applications. So, so who's governing that? The, the states ultimately are governing, as I said before, each country that is a party to the treaty is going to be responsible ultimately for the actions of its states because not only is there this obligation to authorize and continually supervise, if something goes wrong, there are liabilities that attach to the launching states as well. Well, and those liabilities, if um, if the damage is to perhaps an aircraft in the airspace, or to a person, or to property on Earth, so your Chinese your Chinese example, if it, it had hit somebody, those are absolute liabilities, and so those so that's that's where the buck stops. Okay. It, the buck stops with the state. Let me ask the audience: How many people, show of hands, have heard of Elon Musk? Show of hands. <laughs> All right. What's his story? Each of you weigh in on this. What is is he in this for the delivery? Does he want to get into travel? Because part of this in this magazine, you're going to love the story in Lyft, where actually there's people thinking about space hotels. But what's his real thing? What does he want to corner the market on? Beginning with you, Diane. I haven't asked him. <laughs> but it looks to me like he likes a challenge, and I think he's 
you know, I, I don't know how much money he's making at the end of the day. I don't know if, if his launches right now are loss leaders or if they're actually, you know, general. I don't know. Um, but I do know that he's really sort of revamped, revamped the relationship between NASA and private industry. And he's also put a lot of the, the legacy launchers, on, you know, on their game. So um, what's he in it for? I, I, I do believe he really does want to go to Mars, but... Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so <clears throat> I as well have not asked uh, Elon kind of, you know, what's going on, so I can't speak intelligently to, to his thoughts. But from the outside and just having heard him speak uh, uh, in Adelaide at the IAC uh, in Australia and that sort of thing, it seems that he's allergic to apathy and lethargy. And the thing is, you know, some of us in this room can remember at least I remember the tail end of the Apollo uh, 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 era, there was a lot of inspiration. This was something that rallied people together. People could kind of get really inspired by this sort of thing. And I think that sort of inspiration has weaned a bit over the decades. And especially in space, you know, we, we've seen the space shuttle get retired. What does that really mean to NASA and all these things? And okay, we have the space station, but you know, some people around the globe say, okay, yeah, this thing's going around the planet 16 times a day, so who cares? When are we going to the moon again? That sort of stuff. And so I genuinely think, ultimately, that Elon is highly interested in inspiring humanity. I think that he's interested in inspiring people, and space just happens to be a domain that can kind of gather this sort of inspiration if done the right way. And I think that his poking and prodding and the work that he's done has basically excited the system, if you will, and has created kind of a, a buzz again. We're in a new space race, and it's not government-led, it's commercially-led, and he's part of that kind of impetus, if you will. On Elon Musk, Sonia. Uh, I would say, again, not having spoken to him personally, um, you know, I, I would say he's the, the Glenn Curtis of, of our time, that, um, you know, and a little bit different from the Wright brothers. I mean, the Wright brothers were first, and then and then you had Glenn Curtis, who was you know a tremendous in, innovator, um, and a, a tremendous leader in terms of you know wanting to share what he had developed and and not you know holding to patents and that sort of thing. And, and we see a lot of those characteristics with with Elon Musk, and but he's definitely the the disruptor. You know, he's a disruptor of the space industry. He's a disruptor of the energy industry. He's a disruptor of the automotive industry. You know, it's and and but he's not alone. You know, there's several other angel investors and so forth that are, um, you know, the Paul Allens and the Robert Bigelow and and Jeff Bezos and um, Richard Branson and you know they're you know they're regenerating it. They're reinvigorating what we probably should have been doing 20, 30 years ago. You know, they're just making sure that we catch up and, and stay on track. A fascinating thing I read from the research that was done for this lift piece was a quote from you that there's a comparison between when aviation was getting off the ground and delivering mail, and I want you all to weigh in, beginning with you, Sonia, that there's a comparison to the way the government handed off things like aviation with airplanes to the way they've sort of appeared to hand off space to the private sector. Beginning with you, Sonia, take us through well, this for that's, the panel. So in the, you know, in the, in the very you know, mid, well, 1925 was the first Airmail Act, where the government contracted with airlines, if you could call them that, you know, sometimes just one person with an airplane, to deliver mail. And they, through several pieces of legislation, they encouraged these airlines to start carrying passengers and build bigger airplanes and to do things more uh, on the cheap, <laughs> uh, more efficiently and so forth. And that rolled us right into an age of, of the airlines like we have today. Whether, whether you enjoy flying or not today, that's, that's where we're at. Um, and we can kind of see that with how NASA is now contracting with SpaceX and Orbital and Boeing and so forth to take cargo and, and eventually people next year, so we're, we've been told, um, to the International Space Station. So that's kind of the evolution, but there's also, as, as Diane mentioned, some barnstorming going on, a little bit of gold rush, uh, you know, that, that we're kind of seeing some glimmers of, so it's exciting. And did the government back out and the private sector stepped up, or did the government push the private sector um, into it? Maybe a little bit of both. You know, if you, to really understand the history, you know, you have to look at all the players. You could argue that William Boeing um, was was also was ready to push and, and develop the airlines without 
as much help subsidy from from the government. You know, our our society is very is typically you know not willing to subsidize the beginning of an industry. Um, even though some of the, but we have in the past, certainly with the airlines and, and rail and, and so forth, you know, big, big, difficult tasks sometimes need the government behind them. But then it's time for the government to back off. As Additional well. viewpoints, Mariba? Yeah, I mean, my perspective on, on this whole thing is, my opinion is that government should be in the business of risk retirement. You know, there's, there, there's a certain amount of risk of doing things in space, the government created NASA and all these things and a lot of risk was retired and so I think commercialization should always be kind of the end goal of the government to not just develop and keep and try to kind of hoard this sort of thing but to develop retire risk and then once once that risk has been retired then you know commerce can come in make a profit generate jobs that sort of thing so I think risk retirement is really what the government should be in Diane. But there's a certain amount of risk sharing that goes mm -hmm. on between the United States government and, and the private sector, and that's been in place since mid 90s yeah, about the mid 90s, um, I, if I'm not mistaken. And so, you know, the, the thought was that, and, and in fact, it's even in the Commercial Space Launch Act, which was our first legislation here in the U.S. with regard to the commercial sector, 1984, that um, you know the, the Secretary of Transportation and the government was supposed to facilitate, encourage, and promote mm -hmm. the private sector or commercial. Uh, space launches, and and so in 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 trying to achieve that goal, um, it came uh, it came about that there was a risk sharing and an indemnification that stayed in. So it wasn't a completely a risk retirement. And we we have to not just think that you know commercial space is brand new because it's not. We've had a vibrant commercial space sector with regard to telecommunications, mm -hmm. then launching came in, and now we have this this much more democratized kind of transportation matrix that we're looking at. But the risk has gone through some changes. There was a, a time about 10 years, about 10 years ago when uh, the U.S. government actually commissioned a study to see whether or not this indemnification, this risk sharing, mm -hmm. should be retired. And it learned that around the world, other countries had modeled themselves and modeled the way that they handled the risk that ultimately fell to the state because of the Outer Space Treaty and the Liability Convention. And that if the US was to retract this, this risk sharing, that we would no longer be competitive. So there's a certain amount of partnership that exists now, and I think that that may, will likely continue. To borrow a newspaper term, let me do a sidebar. You are at a space traffic management conference um, I believe in January, was it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we and did then that you, here. Yeah, I know you've spoken around the country, including at University of Texas at Austin, I believe, mm -hmm. where, Mariba, you were at the same conference. Was there any consensus from this thing you went to in terms of solutions and where we're going? Did you pick up anything from that? I don't think that we're in a consensus, um, in, in the consensus part of things right now with regard to coordinating orbital activities, mm -hmm. how to share data, how to deal with mm -hmm. debris, um, so those are the space situational awareness parts of things, and then how to, what norms to create and who should enforce them. So I think right now we're still in a hunting and gathering mode, and I think a lot of smart people that are concerned are getting together all around the world, and they're sharing um, their ideas, and they're also sharing their expertise and their know-how, and so we didn't really come to a consensus. This particular conference was interesting because some things that had surfaced over the past couple of years at other conferences, this was the first one we held, uh, rather the fourth one that we held here at Embry-Riddle. And every year we, we uh, try to identify research needs. And so each year you'll see it build, and you'll see that some of those research needs get answered. So not so much consensus as sharing. And then what we had this year was some simulations were um, performed on one of the days of the conference. So some of the things that we said we wanted to see, we got to see simulations of, of, of what companies had come up with them. So I don't think we're at consensus yet. Um, in fact, when I was talking at, at, at uh, Mariba's university, the whole idea was, is there a, is there a sustainable solution? And, if, and, and I say, I posit, yes, there is. Um, there are probably many more than one. And it's getting you know, political will behind them and getting states, countries, to, to buy into them. When you think of who's in commercial space, you think United States, Russia, China, maybe India, Luxembourg? Showcase to our viewers how Luxembourg has become, in essence, forgive me, the Delaware of space. How did they get into it? Well, actually, 
Luxembourg is a very big satellite manufacturing mecca. And um, the University of Luxembourg is also very um, actively involved in some of the governance issues that have surfaced with regard to that. And they saw an opportunity. There, again, um, there's uh, an article, and going back to the Outer Space Treaty, our Magna Carta, Article Two, which talks about you know how how to manage. Um, extraction of resources or appropriation of property and whether there's a question as to whether or not mining or asteroid mining would even fall into that category. And the U.S. kind of like, you know, put the first shot over the bow back in 2015 by making a statement in a piece of legislation that was uh, went through the hopper at that point and said that it, the U.S. government uh, did not think that the, read these activities as being compliant with international obligations, but went no further. And that, that was taking a first step, and that, that was a very controversial place. Well, Luxembourg came in right after that and said, we too think that these activities for the private sector or, or whomever are compliant with international obligations. And they went a little further, and they, they enacted some other legislation that would make it very um, uh, beneficial or, or very uh, desirable for com companies, and some of them are U.S. companies, to actually um, do business there. So where there might be some legal questions in some countries, there weren't in Luxembourg. So it's a relatively small country that doesn't launch its own satellites, but does manufacture and, and has a very robust and long-time industry in that, that also saw an opportunity and took it. One of the uh things that I know our audience is also wondering about. And we're going to start taking your questions, so have your ideas in your heads to come down to our microphones. We'll be taking those of you who are watching us online, your questions as well. Militarization of space, is it happening? Is it too early? Are there guards against anybody taking control? Can you speak to that, Mariba? <laughs> See, when he does that, I, I, I know I, he's got I hope something. the government's listening to me very intently right now. No, so, um, look, the military's been in space since space started. The military's always going to be in space. So when I hear militarization, I kind of think, well, it's kind of this overloaded kind of term. So, so military's been in space. They'll always be in space. In terms of having weapons on orbit, I'm not going to really try to speak to that here. But what I will say is that there is this overwhelming kind of sense, not just in the United States, but in other countries, that listen, um, conflicts occur. They're occurring right now. Space is used to be this high ground that was um, impenetrable and unreachable by most countries. Now, with access, lower cost access to space, more and more countries can get on orbit. And so there is, listen, military organizations, uh, by definition, have to be a bit paranoid. And so there's kind of this speculation of, well, you know, some countries, we might get in a conflict with them. Certainly, a lot of our resources are in space. Like uh, Diane said earlier, there's no kind of space vice. There's no space cop. So there's a worry, there's a concern that these systems might be hindered, tampered with. Uh, to, to get some sort of strategic or tactical advantage. So there's certainly a concern for, from military organizations around the globe that these things could be done in space. And so there's this notion of trying to ensure that there's resilience and robustness to any sort of attack on orbit. And that, that, that's going to happen. Sonia, will there be a space economy? In other words, those things that are done on Earth are deemed different if they're in space? Will there be a whole economy set up potentially? I don't, I don't think it's really different um, because it, it's so, it's actually so ingrained in what we're doing right now. You know, you, you would probably be amazed at what GPS is relied on for transportation, for delivering your packages, for even banking. The timing stamp is, is essential in calculating when funds have been transferred and who owes what interest and that sort of thing. So it, it's very ingrained. In fact, it, GPS is just one example. It's so ingrained that the FAA has, doesn't even try to figure out how much money we make on GPS because there's just too many aspects of it to, to even consider in their, in their calculations of looking at you know, how, how we benefit economically from, um, from GPS, which is a military system. It's still a military system. And a lot of people aren't aware of that it. either. Yeah, a lot, yeah, but we but we all use it. 
you know, we're all reliant on it. What would we do without GPS? <laughs> Some of us couldn't navigate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing that I was going to add to that is I think the mistake is in trying to uh, isolate space as an economic kind of thing. I mean, when we talk about economy in, you know, just globally, you know, rarely have I ever heard somebody say, well, what's the economy just due to flight? What's the economy just due to ground? What's, what's the economy due to just maritime? The economy is, it's all interwoven. And I think mm. space is just another domain that gets interwoven in that fabric and trying to isolate it in this way. I, I don't, I think we need to start migrating away uh, from trying to uh, describe it that way. It's just another area of activity that lends itself yeah. to the overall economic capability of any given entity. Sonia and, and, and then yeah. Diane. And, and just to piggyback on that, you know, we, we kind of got into this idea, especially when the, when the automotive industry was in crisis, you know, do we fix this one industry? And it's, you know, there's a lot of industries that are, that are affected. Um, so I don't, I don't think we can just tease it out and just deal with it as some isolated thing. Maybe at one time, maybe in the 1960s, but certainly not today. You know, we're, we're well past that. Diane? So listening to your question and listening to the answers, I was wondering if you maybe might have meant would there be a separate economy if there yes. was a Thank colony you. somewhere else? Yes. Okay, so, um, and the answer to that is it depends. <laughs> Good lawyer answer. <laughs> um, because that, you know, you, this can be set up, and right now there's, there are people that are trying to kind of figure out how a, a village on the moon, that would be like a community with multiple users from multiple jurisdictions, and, and how would this work, you know, in, in multiple sectors. And, and I think that when, you know, we're far from that point, but I think ultimately what that's going to come down to is, once again, it's going to be political will, and it's also going it, to, there, there's going to have to be some governance and, and some economy mm -hmm. that will exist. Um, it may be ancillary to what's going on on Earth, or it might be self-supporting. We don't know. We don't know. A lot of things can happen between now and then. But I think a model for how some of these things uh, can be um, worked out, even to the most minute detail, is by looking at the, doc the different legal instruments that govern the International Space Station, where you have multiple jurisdictions. You have different countries that are partnering and, and different legal regimes. And they decided among them whose laws were going to govern if there was a criminal situation and whose laws would govern if there was an intellectual property situation. And I think it's going to be a similar, um, a similar s sort of procedure that will come up with something when we're going off planet. Okay, it's a jump ball question for anybody. Space, Florida, are they in this at all? Are they involved? Okay, to what extent? Diane? Well, it's not my turn, I just spoke. <laughs> anybody, a jump ball yeah, means anybody yeah, can yeah, jump in. Should. Mariba? Space Florida? Yeah. What, what role that? do they play ah. in commercial space? <laughs> I mean, yeah, so clearly they have a, a, a launch uh, facility, right? I mean, they have a clear role when it comes to launching things. They have but they're not a regulatory body, or are they? Well, no, it's, legisl it's created by the legislature, so Space Florida is actually a public-private partnership, and I know you, you like those as a model. I do. Yes, you do. <laughs> and, and Space Florida has been around for a while. It had a different name, but I, I can't remember when its name got changed, but it's actually a vehicle. It's, it's mandate, it's legislative mandate here in the state of Florida is to promote the space industry. So it has a lot of facets. One of those facets is to try to attract economic development and and make make uh, make it a, again like Luxembourg did for uh, a, another sector to make launching and and uh, companies like OneWeb want to come here so they make you know they have a, the ability to give incentives to come and do business here on the space coast um, other things that, that they are able to do is work deals with um, Cape Canaveral and Kennedy Space Center with regards to making what used to be primarily just a, a federal launch facility into a really vibrant multi-user multi-purpose spaceport and so they've been really instrumental in converting and transitioning a lot of the infrastructure that's there, um, uh, negotiating the contracts, some of the liability issues. And so Space Florida has a lot of hats. It does a lot of things, a lot of good. As I said when we opened this discussion, this thing could go on for a long time. We are going to take your questions <laughs> in the next couple of minutes, so be ready. I have to ask, we have an airport right next door to us here in Daytona Beach. Is the increasing amount of commercial launches that are going to happen, are they going to affect local airports? Will they have to either look over their shoulders or will it change the way they operate with the advancements in commercial space? Can anyone answer that? You know, so 
I guess my opinion of it is if you can lower the uncertainty of knowing where things are going to go, if you can increase predictability, then you can handle more traffic. Okay? So the thing is, when we first started with launch vehicles, these things were kind of uncertain, how they might behave. Oh, it might, you, know, you want it to go this way, but it might go this way, and that sort of thing. As, as these uncertainties start reducing and we get more efficient and more accurate with how we do these things, and these things become much more predictable, I think in that measure you're able to handle more traffic without having to kind of do this sort of rerouting uh, uh, to the, to the uh, you know, extent that's done today. My friends, um, at the, pardon the vernacular, but there's uh, almost a food fight going on among states, mm -hmm. cities, and counties to get some of this business, mm -hmm. including here. Mm -hmm. People say this will create jobs. I've heard 30, 300, 3,000, 30,000 jobs as a result of commercial space. Is it, as it appears to an outsider like me, that you have states, cities, all competing to try to get companies like Elon's company or Blue Origin to all start operations in their states? Who's the regulating body? There's nobody to say, no, you can't go there, but you can go there. Is it whoever offers the best well, deal? No, it, it almost in a sense because you're, you're talk, now you're into corporate law. So basically, you're you're dealing with okay, what what are the state, you know, benefits for you know coming to Florida versus going to Delaware versus setting up in Pennsylvania, um, and and you do have some states that are actively competing: Virginia, California, mm -hmm. Oklahoma, Texas, Florida. You know, various states that are that are trying to bring that business in and. You know, and, and they can offer all kinds of incentives with liability and also with limits tax to liability. And that sort so of Florida thing. was the second one after after Wallops, after mm -hmm. Virginia, and so yes, there, there's a lot mm -hmm. of that enticing. So they they all have to go through mm -hmm. the the spaceport mm -hmm. licensing framework, which is uh, handled by the FAA Office of Commercial mm -hmm. Space Transportation. But then past those, which are the the minimum requirements, states can actually make it more attractive mm -hmm. for for companies, and that's what's happening. And so the limits to liability can. Um, they can include everybody in the launch supply chain or they can only include certain ones and some of those have been rewritten to make them more attractive after other states got more aggressive and and so you are definitely seeing that but uh, kind of kind of kind of think of the Amazon you know the bid for Amazon's new headquarters I mean that's the same sort of that's the same sort of deal you know only you know we're talking about individual cities as opposed to you know with state support to to offer some of the deals that they can offer but that's a similar, you know, but that goes on in all industries. Mm -hmm. You know, when Boeing opened up its its aircraft manufacturing plant in South Carolina, that was a that was a huge, you know, move. Where is Boeing going to go? Where are they going to set up? Where are the jobs going to be? Um, in, so it in, happens all all the in all industries. It, forgive me. In this magazine, there's also speculation. Mm -hmm. Will we have one day space hotels? Mm -hmm. People go up, <laughs> hang out at a hotel somewhere mm -hmm. circling the planet. Is that likely to happen? Okay, so let me put it this way, all right? Um, I'm not gonna say absolutely not, but if you had to talk to some astronauts without the lights on and that sort of stuff and say, so really how is it to be up on orbit? So many of them get sick all the time. Could you imagine that? It's like, <laughs> how many of those, of, those, of those sick bags are you gonna go up with? And, and, ah, how was your time up there? Well, I was sick the whole time, but it was kind of beautiful as you know, I was. <laughs> Let's yeah. be realistic. The thing is, people idolize this whole space thing, and they're like, oh, my goodness. You know, I'm going to be floating. No, no, no. <laughs> Everything in orbit is actually in a state of free fall, right? It's like jumping out of a building and just never landing. That's yeah. what being on orbit means. Think about that for a little bit, and think, ah, oh, I want to do that for a week, right? Uh, do I go to Tahiti? No, I want to be sick <laughs> for a week going around the planet 16 times a day. So I want to say that... It's kind of this idealized thing, but people need to get a little bit calibrated on the realities of what it means to be in space. And coming back, you know, having uh, your muscles atrophy or having your systems, they still haven't figured that out yet. So it's like, okay, I'm just a bag of jello when I land on the earth and somebody has to wheel me off of this thing. And yeah, I had lots of fun. Let's. So I just want to calibrate that whole space hotel thing. The, a bit. the reason that I asked it was because of Richard. I'm sorry, did I tell you how I feel about it? I just want to. You know, <laughs> they were all going to run I've for their travel agents here. tomorrow. 
uh, is because of Richard Branson supposedly yeah. going to be up within the next couple of years. So yeah, well, it, it's only a lot of people think that the that the motivation for space tourism, whether it's hotels or just you know these joy rides, uh, so to speak, is is that you know that's the end game. You know that's the end game for these companies that are trying to do that, and and that's it's kind of like a way to to uh, from the folks that I've talked to in that industry. It's, it's not the end game, it's the start. You know, it's kind of like barnstorming back in the day when airplanes you know, were first a thing and they were new, pilots that had airplanes would go around to various communities and offer you a ride for like a dollar or whatever and just so you could experience it. That's basically what space tourism, what Branson is doing. Now, the, now further down the road, that's a means to you know, potentially put our students' satellites into orbit because now they've made a, a very inexpensive vehicle that can deploy a satellite or maybe even take that student into, into sub-orbit for a little while or orbit for a little while and, and run an experiment. That's, you know, and then all the other commercial options after that. But it's just to help develop the technology so now it's, it's really inexpensive. More people have access whether you want to use it for a joyride or you want to use it to do research or develop a new product or whatever it is that you want to do. So that's, yeah, in the back of their minds, if you, if, you know, if you ask a lot of these people, yeah, they don't, they don't want to just be giving joyrides to rich people. <laughs> Minerals and water. Right now on the planet, even in Florida, there's talk about overdevelopment. Is there enough water? Resell versus gray water into the aquifer. Water it could be harvested, technically. There's a lot of ice out there. I think in this issue of Lift Off the Page, it also indicates in the magazine that they've actually calculated a number of ice, the amount of ice that could be then used for water. How do we know this water is any good? The question is this, who decides who gets to harvest those minerals? How's that gonna be done? Each of you I'd like to weigh in. Diane? You know, that, that's, the, <laughs> that's the question. Um, right now, there isn't an overarching authority there is a moon agreement that was, its drafting was finalized in 1979. It was the last of the treaties. It entered into force in 1982. None of the major space powers have ratified it. And yet, and, and one of the things that, that created a lot of its problems were, were that it, it tried to come up with a, a loose um, mandate that there be this authority that was going to decide who could um, harvest water or minerals or resources of any kind, and then how these things would be divvied up, how they would be distributed. So there, would, there was this issue, and it didn't go any further because of that. So there's nothing in place. So right now what you have is you have countries like the U.S., like Luxembourg. Uh, from what I understand, the United Arab Emirates is also, um, they're very close on their law, and it also includes um, the uh, recognition of the country's right mm -hmm. to perform these activities. And so it's kind of left to the states. And then there's the international community. If you want to function in it, then you, you, know, you have to try to explain that you're not doing this to, at, at the detriment of anybody else. But there is no boss of everybody. It's sort of, that, that's why it's so important that Every, every opportunity be uh, maximized to make sure that people understand just what the ramifications of having more and more activities and more and more access, more and more congestion, what is the consequence on the environment, not necessarily making it into a, trying to, to get it back to unring the bell and make it pristine, but at least make it so that it's usable now and, and does good for us now, but that it will be there in generations to come. And that's what sustainability is all about. Mariba? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not a lawyer, so I'll definitely defer that to Diane for sure, but, but my sentiment about it kind of goes along with what she said in terms of being able to quantify what the impact is to others. You know, if going out and harvesting these things uh, has minimal or no impact to the environment and is not to the detriment of other people in other parts of the planet, then it seems like it's okay. You know, maybe it's something akin to, uh, you know, fishing uh, in deep seas and, and, and this sort of stuff where you have to think about the environment and you can't overfish and you can't do this, that, or the other because you've somewhat quantified what the impact and detriment might be to the environment and to other people in other countries. That sort of analysis, that sort of quantification, I think, needs to happen, and I've not really seen that to date. People are thinking about it, but I think that you know, the an answer is still kind of out at large when it comes to that. Sonia? 
That's a tough question. I, you know, I definitely agree with, you know, thinking about the long-term environment. Um, you know, we, we kind of see that we have a problem with that just when we talk about the Earth um, on occasion. So it, it's much harder to think about, you know, something beyond um, our own environment right now. Um, but I think also that when, when you have a lot of these people that are, have invested money into these types, of, uh, these types of activities, certainly it's not a short-term investment, it's not a small investment. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think a lot of the people that, some, you know, a lot of the, the experts that are, especially with the space, uh, with the asteroid mining and some of the other space activities, those are the kinds of people that do think about these types of things. I mean, if you think about Elon Musk, he's certainly thinking about the environment because he's a proponent of renewable energy and, and electric cars. I mean, so he, he has, you know, he's thinking about those types of things. Um, and, and again, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the other people involved with these ventures are also thinking about these things. And it, it's also important that we just, that we stay, as a, as a nation, we stay engaged in these types of conversations across the board. Um, we don't want to be left out of that conversation by any stretch of the imagination. But part of that also means that we have to remain technologically capable as well. We can't, you know, we can't be left behind. Diane. Well, and there are initiatives, like internationally. So right now there's an initiative in The Hague that is uh, convened. It was convened, and I believe it finished its work, and I think it's going to extend to come together and come up with uh, space governance for resource utilization. Mm -hmm. It's called The Hague Space Governance on Resource Utilization Group. And they put together building blocks, so kind of the elements of what should be considered if countries are going to allow, through that Article 6 authorization and continuing supervision, whether that's, you know, hands-off authorization or whether that's more, more hands-on. But at least these are the things that should be considered from an international standpoint, taking actors those that are technologically mm -hmm. capable and those that are maybe not as technologically capable but might have something else to offer. Perhaps uh, maybe their technology isn't space capable, but maybe they're um, profoundly developed with regard to mining. Mm -hmm. So Canada doesn't launch, but Canada has a very, very well-developed and ro robust mining industry. And so this Hague group is, is listening to all of that and, and putting together these building blocks that then can be utilized by countries all over the place. And, and the US is, is involved. Mm -hmm. How, well. many, how many of you in the audience thinks this reminds them of Columbus sailing, you know, across the, the ocean blue? No roadmap, nobody knows where it's going to go. I, I have to ask, space pirates, is it likely that we're going to have to deal with space pirates? People take folks, take their belongings, because there's no policing action. This may be a long shot, but I know that you have an opinion on it. <laughs> Good guess. So. Um, <clears throat> I would say that every, every domain that's been explored, uh, that has you know, experienced kind of geographical sparsity, uh, a lack of uh, law enforcement, has experienced piracy in one way or the other, right? When people were crossing the US, they'd get ambushed and these sorts of things, bad things would happen on the seas. Uh, we have piracy on the seas uh, to this day. To think that space is this domain where everybody is going to just be so benevolent is extremely naive. Of course it's gonna happen in space, right? And the thing is, with more and more people launching stuff and uh, lack of monitoring and, and transparency and being able to, to assess all these things, you better believe that some people, if they haven't done it already, they're definitely going to try to affect the bottom line of other people to try to gain business for sure. So I'm not gonna say, well, somebody's actually gonna hijack a satellite and take it over and do weird stuff with it. It could happen. But even just degrading the signals of a competitor. I mean, here's the thing, right? I love soccer, okay? I love soccer. I like watching uh, Leo Messi from Barcelona score goals, this sort of stuff. And when I'm watching the El Clasico between Barcelona and Real Madrid, I gotta tell you, I don't want any interruption and my HDTV better be crystal clear. I don't want to see any graininess. And if for five minutes I see graininess, what's the first thing I'm going to do? Who, who's the competitor so I can change my service so I can, yeah. you know? So all it takes is for somebody to degrade a signal every so often to just annoy the customer. Customers get 
quickly annoyed because we, we've become intolerant of our definition of perfection and that's all it takes to upset somebody's bottom line. And so I think those things have probably happened. I'm gonna predict they're gonna happen with a lot more frequency, especially, again, in a domain that is mostly, uh, has a lack of monitoring and quantification and assessment. For our regional audience, I think we should talk about a little bit about what our students at Embry-Riddle are doing here as it relates to commercial space. Anybody want to jump in? I know you have worldwide concerns. We, as well, well. We, we have worldwide students that work at SpaceX and NASA and you know various companies. You know, so even though most of our degrees on the worldwide side are are all uh, well, at least in the College of Aeronautics, aeronautics is a, is the big theme. Um, but we do have students that are that are working for for SpaceX, and it's very exciting to talk to them about what they're doing and you know, and, and following the launches and, and thinking about, you know, your students being involved in those types of things. It's, you know, it's, it's, great, to, it's great to hear that. You were military and then went to Embry-Riddle, yes. correct? Came out. Mariba, you graduated in 99, mm -hmm. was it? And yeah, if you, if you must know, sure. It's only 12. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then, you know, you went to several higher institutions to conduct your research. Dr. Howard, you have said you came into space law later in life. I did. Okay, give us a little of that background. Well, that got I loved you this space point. from young, but I, I came, I came to space law. Yes, I, I uh, was going to go to law school because I wanted more purpose in my life. I thought I would get involved in environmental law. I was waiting for parts for my car, and a guy started chatting me up. He said, "What, well, what do you do?" I said, "I'm going to start law school next week." He said, "Oh, what kind of law do you want to practice?" I said, "Environmental law. I want to do something for the greater good." He said, well, you want to clean up an environment, you ought to look at space. This was a while ago. And I said, oh my God, space law, you mean like Star Trek? He said, yes. I said, huh, I moved a little further down on the bench, <laughs> got away from him. And as soon as I went to my law school for orientation, you know, you go to the library as part of your orientation, they said, what would you like to look up? I said, I want to look up space law. I want to see if it really is a thing. Mm -hmm. And guess what? I found the Outer Space Treaty, and I've been hooked. I was hooked on space before that, but I was hooked on space law from that point. But I want to go back. You said, let's talk about the local component and, and students. I teach in what is now known as the Space Flight Operations Program. Originally, it was called the, the Commercial Space Ops Program, and that's what you, you uh, introduced me as. And there are a number of my students that are here in the audience, so a shout out to them. Thank you so much. I know we're getting close to the end of the semester, and here you are on a Monday night. Mm -hmm. But we've graduated now over 50 students, and, and we are now at the end of our fifth year, so in a relatively short time. And we have students all over the place, so we have students at Virgin Galactic, we have a safety compliance officer and a regulatory compliance officer, a licensing compliance officer. We have student, a student at ULA. We have a few students uh, doing um, analysis. We have students that have done internships at the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs and, and at NASA. We have we have students at Kennedy Space Center, so we have we have students. We are actually putting our students out in the world. So that we're doing that in an extremely local component, and I just thought I'd give my students a shout out. There you go. Yeah. We're going to take questions from our uh, watching audience on YouTube as well as here. If you'll step to the microphone for those assembled here, we want to get you on record. I think we have. Do we have a question first to start, Alan, for our panel tonight? Yes, we do. Um, uh, if we can begin with a Michael McPherson, uh, as a rising uh, aeronautical engineering and business administration graduate, where should my focus be if I'm attempting to find my niche and start a business in the industry? I was considering space junk management or spacecraft MRO. Where can I get this experience and knowledge base and to create the standards for these? Maripa? So, um, where he, he's studying, I, I miss what he was studying again. What are you studying again, sir? Uh, aerospace engineering okay. and business administration. All right, so, 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 so the question is, where do you get experience to, to, to get into the... Listen, I mean, um, you know, if you're studying aerospace engineering and business, I think you need to start just participating with industry with a lot of opportunities in terms of like small business innovation research uh, grants. There are BAAs out there. There are lots of companies and universities doing research. So I think just get, getting involved and, and participating in some of these activities is you know step one. You'll gain some experience uh, by participating in some of these kind of contracts and research grants, and then you know the, that'll kind of pave the way and show you um, what it is that you like, what are the things that you don't like, 
uh, uh, regarding such a broad field, and, and, and that'll motivate you and, and kind of you know give you an idea where you need to go next. All right, before we go back to, I know one of our viewers wanted to know about space junk. Two things: we actually have someone here who's working at the research park uh, at Embry Riddle, who is actually working on I think the, the prospects in the future for a tow truck to or to go to things that are in space, repair them, and might give them a hundred year life. That is in Lift Magazine, but who's Responsible for space junk. Is there is there a way that we could bring this this this? You want to see your slide? Yeah. Okay. This is a slide right. that Mariba brought. Yeah. Maybe so, you can explain it to the audience. Yeah, yeah. So 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 here's here's the thing, right? I know that that looks like a bunch of dots, and uh, it might be a bit scary. Uh, interestingly enough, if you just Google astrograph, you can go to your mobile and, and and see this sort of thing. But the Department of Defense maintains a catalog, a database of about twenty three thousand objects from the size of a softball all the way to a school bus, that's them right there. And so uh, when you want to talk about having something, a, a truck that goes up to something to repair it, you're talking about that truck going to one or more of those kind of, all those objects that you see uh, orbiting the Earth, trying to maneuver through, through, through all that. Now, let me just, uh, that's not to scale. It's not like <laughs> when you look at the sky, you but, can't see anything. And everybody but, wants to know, are you responsible for your own junk? I don't want to derail you, but are you responsible for The United States puts stuff up there and it becomes space junk, are they responsible to retrieve it? So that's what I've heard, but Diane can give a proper answer to that question. So it depends on when they put it up there, okay? <laughs> really? So, so things before a certain date, there was no, no plan. Now, there's an end of life plan needs to be built into your safety review. So you have to have some idea. So there are wow. um, some international, again, um, there are guidelines that the United Nations Committee on Peaceful Uses um, adopted in 2007. They came out of work that was at another committee. And ultimately, it's up to the state to do something because there's nothing that's, you know, it's not part of the Outer Space Treaty. But because it, uh, countries are responsible for the, the uh, they're, they're responsible in perpetuity for the things that happen because of their launching states' uh, space objects. And if there's a problem, that state is ultimately going to be on the hook. Most responsible states are going to have something built into their domestic legislation that's going to include that piece. So are they responsible? So yes, but only after a certain time and only if they've put it on their national law. The U.S. has. Okay. Only on February 29th at noon if you're, I'm just joking. <laughs> no, no, but, no, no, no. Uh, but for the and, purposes and, and of country, clarity. And companies are getting better. So. But, this, but as we talked about once, there is no waste management for no. space. No. So there's no company making money hauling away other people's stuff. Yet. Yet. So there's right now work that's being done, DOD, mm -hmm. DARPA, mm -hmm. has put together a thing called CONFERS, and it's getting a lot of experts together about this whole idea of um, on-orbit servicing. And you know that's just one step away from active debris removal. It's right. a lot of the same technology, a lot of the same physics, a lot of the same engineering challenges, if you will. You know, Do we push it? Do we blow it? Do we tether it? Do we, do, do we get a sail? What do we do? How do we do okay. it? Do we grapple with it? But, but it's a lot of the same technology. Yeah, I mean, Back to you. Yeah, so I mean, one of the issues is this, right? People have not seen a way to monetize cleaning up junk. Why? I mean, you'd think, ah, you see all those objects up there, 23,000 things, like why isn't this a thing that I can just make money and clean junk up? And that's because space is still large. Those things aren't to scale. How do you quantify the real risk? And the thing is, it's a lot of guesswork. And that's, that, so, so unfortunately, there's a lot of science that needs to be had there's a lack of being able to rigorously quantify risk. And the thing is, if you say, well, if I don't do anything, I'm OK. If I do something, why am I going to do something? That costs money. That, so it's very difficult to kind of motivate this, incentivize this sort of way to monetize being the, the space garbage uh, cleanup people. And what happens if you do something, and then you create a bigger problem? Uh -oh, what if you oops. end up with some unintended consequences? Bad so that, news. That comes about as well. Let me also add another issue has been this national security issue. So there's, there's been a lack of political will um, with countries saying, yes, we're, we're down with this happening because what's to stop? I mean, there's no traffic cops. It's hard, you know, no CSI outer space. So what happens if, you know, this on-orbit servicing or active debris removal um, object goes rogue and all of a sudden starts going and, and tampering with 
an object it wasn't it wasn't you know contracted to do. So it's it's a difficult situation, especially when you're dealing with paranoid military people. Like a space <laughs> dust buster. All and of a sudden, you start sucking issue up that everything un around unintended it. consequences can happen, and and what happens mm -hmm. then? Okay. Well, and, and just really quickly, um, in the last uh, SpaceX launch to the cargo mission to the International Space Station, part of that is a research experiment to look at right. space debris. That's right. So, mm -hmm. and part of that problem is starting to actively address it on orbit. So, so it's happening slowly. Let's get some voices here right into the microphone. Thank you for being with us today. <coughs> Uh, my name is Jacob Yoder, and uh, I'm a freshman in the Space Flight Operations Program here at Embry-Riddle. And my question is, I'd like a viewpoint from all of y'all. Um, so you've mentioned that space and, and going to space is akin to the gold rush, and that you've meant there's resources out there to be uh, harvested. But I guess the... It can be an argue that people went west in this idea of manifest destiny, not necessarily for resources, mm -hmm. but as this idea of expanding. So do you think the first colonies will be for resources or just mankind's idea to expand? Like the Chinese making these yeah. islands to just move further east. I think that's a very touchy question, and I think that there are a lot of efforts um, in international discussion to avoid the words colonization and manifest destiny, mm -hmm. because that's precisely why we don't have, why Article 2 says there will be no mm -hmm. national appropriation by claim of sovereignty, by exploration or use, or by any other mm -hmm. means. And there's this awareness and understanding that things didn't go so well for all mm -hmm. peoples back in those, those gold rush mm -hmm. days. And so this is, this is exactly what I'm talking mm -hmm. about, being, about being sensitive to the international community. And, finding some sort of sweet spot where we do things that are economically viable, that we've seen an enormous benefits, societal benefits, because of space applications, but that we don't do them to the detriment of any peoples or to our planet or, an, or another celestial body. And so I, I think there's, those are very, very, um, those are not things that I would ever be comfortable saying in mixed company in an international <coughs> fora. And I don't know anybody who would speak in those terms. So wow. you, you've got to be careful. Yeah. Absolutely, you've got to be sensitive. Yes. I mean, so, 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 so my, my take on it is this, right? Um, probably not everybody would do it to become rich or whatever. Some people would just do it for the sake of adventure, right? It's like, yeah, give me a chance. I want to be the first person to blah, blah, blah. How many people on planet Earth would say, I want to move to Mars to have a better life? <laughs> Probably zero, right? So, so I think the spirit of trying to go someplace else to improve your life condition, that's probably not what the case would be right now. But certainly, um, you know, profit would not be the only incentive. Some people would just want to do it just for the sake of adventure. I'm not one of them, by the way. So, If we have a question from the booth, from our YouTube audience. Yes, we do. Uh, we have uh, related questions from two different people. Um, one, a gentleman named Kendall Russell and a Harris Kay, um, both asked about international regulations. Um, what role do you predict the UN will play in future international space legislation? And there's been a lot of talk of international regulation on asteroid mining as well as situational awareness. Uh, should these be regulated by one or two independent groups? Let's take them separately. The UN question first. Alan, if we could, give us the UN question again, please. We'll take them separately. Sure. What role do you predict the UN will play in future international space legislation? Well, the UN has had a role in, in space legislation since the very beginning. So there was the ad hoc committee was put together in 1958. Um, you know, they did a little bit of, uh, quite a bit of research, not a little bit of research, to determine what mechanism would best serve um, the the space sector and the burgeoning space law community and trying to come up with a way to um, structure itself and its relationship with the United Nations. And so the Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space is what came out of that work. And it has two subcommittees. One is the Science and Technical Subcommittee, and the other is the Legal Subcommittee, because there's been an understanding since the very beginning that we need both sides. There's actually more than just those two sides, but we certainly need both sides of the brain working on these things. So there's the, the, the UN, and through this committee, has had a role in, in, 
in the uh, development of space law, and that's where the Outer Space Treaty and the other four treaties were actually negotiated. But that's not all that, that has come out of that work. So there's also declarations and resolutions, there's principles. And then most recently, the debris mitigation guidelines came out of the science and technical uh, subcommittee. And even more recently than that has been a, a very, very deep effort to come up with guidelines for long-term sustainability of space activities. Uh, there are 12 that were finalized two years ago. There were nine that were finalized back in February. There uh, uh, and a preamble, and we'll see whether or not any of the remaining, I believe it is six that are under discussion, make it through. But that is still a forum, but it's not the only forum. So there's a lot of things that happen in other arenas that the UN is, um, you know, the UN is there, but it's state to state, and there's this understanding that there are so many stakeholders, and a lot of them are the commercial, the commercial sector, private actors. And so there's kind of like a, you know, you have the state, and then you also have things that are coming from the bottom up, and you have a lot of the kind of discourse that we've been describing here. But the United Nations definitely has a role, because at the end of the day, it's countries that, that, that have the power to make laws. Sonia, well, then, then Mariba. Then, Diane, do you, do you see uh, the equivalent of a space ICAO? Not named as such and not yeah. housed in that building, <laughs> per se. I think, uh, you know, it's a question of resources, mm -hmm. so things cost money, mm -hmm. and I don't, um, I, I don't think we're there yet. I think yeah. right now, like mm -hmm. I said before, we're still bounding the mm -hmm. problem. We're still hunting and gathering. I mean, there are a lot of different governance mm -hmm. models, and certainly there are different approaches. I mean, I, I believe that the Russian Federation has some pronounced ideas mm -hmm. on how <laughs> things should be done, and they, 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 they differ from how they're much more command control, and the U.S. is like a lot more laissez-faire, let, let business flourish. And so there are different ideologies that are at work, but does that mean that one's right and one's wrong? No, it means that you, you have a continued discourse, and yes, it does take a long time, but at the end of it, when you finally come up with something, you have agreement. And, and ultimately, if you have agreement, it's a lot easier to get compliance. So I don't think the U.N. is going away. I think the U.N. is right now, with regard to space law, undergoing its own self-examination, if you will, and, and figuring out how best to move forward. There are lots of initiatives at the UN level and at, in Copius to try to achieve more efficiency. Mariba, and then we'll get the second part of the question. Mariba? Yeah, I mean, just briefly to add on, on, you know, add on to what's been said, just my own experiences having been to the UN Copius just a, a couple of times, it's very clear that some countries feel it's very important for the UN to have this sort of global governance role. Uh, I can tell you like the UAE cares about UN-led stuff a lot, but other countries, like Diane said, don't necessarily want the UN to have this kind of overall control of stuff, pay. right? And so um, one concern as well is how unbiased is the UN in all of these things? Who's kind of behind the scenes maybe driving this, that, or the other? So it's just murky water. Uh, and, and lots of mixed feelings uh, across the board, I think. Alan, if you have the second part of our question. Yeah, there's been a lot of talk of international regulation on asteroid mining as well as on situa situational awareness. Should an international organi organization regulate both or should there be two groups to regulate them? One or two groups, panel. Yeah, so here's the thing. I, I, I see asteroid mining and space situational awareness as being very different kind of things that probably shouldn't be uh, mixed uh, together that way. Um, I'll talk to the space situational awareness piece. Um, I think that space needs to be transparent and predictable uh, uh, in order for us to get to safety and sustainability. And so I, space situational awareness is the thing that the foundational kind of level of knowledge to enable that sort of stuff, and I think it needs to be very global. Uh, I think that there shouldn't be any specific um, country or any specific company that kind of is, is left or entrusted with that sort of global monitoring and assessment. I think it needs to be, dare I say, a public-private partnership kind of uh, role where all the different stakeholders can uh, mutually participate for the greater good uh, of the space domain, again, driving towards safety and sustainability. Let's go over here. We have a question from our audience. We'll go right to left and back upstairs to Alan. As questions come in, Alan, let us know the next question. Arthur Burns. Hi, I'm Arthur Burns. I'm a city commissioner in Holly Hill, and I've been involved in local government for 30-some years. I'm a huge space advocate. I run a website called spaceweekly.com. 
But I watch what's going on in Florida. There's a highly funded effort to have a private space center just north of the Kennedy Space Center. That area is Shiloh. Mm -hmm. It is a culturally significant, ec ecologically significant area that, in my opinion, is not necessary since we have all of that land at NASA that's, that's been used. I've been there, I've seen a Florida panther myself in that area. I'm not a, a radical environmentalist, I just, when you mentioned the gold rush, how do we protect Earth and space from these people that just see this as a gold rush to make money for their own pockets? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. So, listen, um, that website that I brought up, that whole astrograph, that's like one of the first steps that I'd like to, to, to use to get other people on board to say, let's, again, have some transparency. Let's get multiple people from across the globe to have a common data lake where everybody can have some idea of what's going on, uh, who's doing what. And I think by making this stuff transparent, by being able to quantify and assess the behavior of certain actors in space and just saying, here's a body of evidence and here's the impact of that behavior, then people can make some informed decisions to get to that protection. But right now, we lack that cooperation and sharing all these observations to have this common data lake because whenever something bad happens in space, it's usually one person that says, ah, so-and-so did this, and that's not so good. And another person will say, not me, I didn't do that. Who's to say any different? There's a, there's a lack of knowledge globally about how people behave in space. I mean, in 2007, that one was very, uh, it, it, was, it was very explicit, the whole blowing up of this satellite that the Chinese did in 2007 that created like, yeah, like 4,000 pieces in one foul swoop, right? Um, that was very overt. And their uh, answer was, oops. Right. Yeah. So, so, so then sometimes, even when you have the evidence, there aren't a whole lot of consequences that come with that sort of stuff. But it, again, that transparency needs to be there, I think, as a first uh, step. Let's go back up in the booth. Alan, next tonight. So uh, from a gentleman named Snowman, how will the commercialization of space lead to or affect relationships between different countries, both in government and in private companies? Bam. What happens if we're in a private partnership with a country, with a company from Russia or China, and things go bad with us? Does all that get set aside, or it's ignored, or what happens? Well, first of all, we wouldn't be in a public-private partnership with China because we have something called export controls when we're talking about um, ish space okay. components and space hardware and space activities. And, and, and forgive me, so, Diane, the reason I would even broach that is general public's perception is, well, we would hitch a ride with the Russians. Why wouldn't we do business well, with the Well, and Chinese? we do. We, we hitch a ride on, with yeah. the Russians all the time. We pay. Actually, we don't hitch it. We pay. We pay yeah. big, big bucks for those rides. Um, with regard to you know, continuing to work with our other international partners, I think this is, you know, it behooves us to do that because I think some of the bigger, more complex things that we want to do, they're very expensive and they require very diverse skill sets, which we don't always have them. So I think that this is another reason why we want to kind of listen to one another and play nicely with others. There are constraints, though, and those constraints are usually, you know, uh, linked up to national security and, and things like export controls. Back up in the booth, Alan. Sure. Uh, is there a conflict of interest with the Outer Space Treaty not encouraging the human race to populate and survive on another celestial body if an extinction event precipitates? Wow. It doesn't address it. It doesn't it, address it? It doesn't address that, no. So we say, sort of make it up as we go along? No, it's just, it's a treaty of general principles. You know, that there's a... But it doesn't address whether or not you can or you cannot. It says it's that space is space activities are for the benefit of all mankind. It, that yeah, I, uses. I guess my question is context, is if there is some sort of like, um, you know, some extinction yeah. event, does it matter? Like yeah. at that point, it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do what yeah. you can to leave, right? right? Yeah. It's like well, you know, yeah. hearing all of this, Sonia, I want to ask you before we go back to another question right over here, ethics does. Do we have like ethical standards or established, or is this thing, commercial space, so new that they 
we don't have the ethical boundaries yet. I, I don't. I don't. I don't think that, that there's no ethical standards. I, you know, I, I wouldn't, I, I would certainly never say that. I, I think, you know, because space is, space is still somewhat mature. You know, we've, yeah. we've been in space for over 50 years, you know, and, and done a lot of business in space, Thank especially you. telecommunications, yeah. um, you know, even some remote sensing, not as much remote sensing as, as we're as seeing now. Yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, we do, you know, other, other than on the, national, on the national security side, but, you know, and I, I don't, I think when, when I did some of my research and, and talked to the people in the industry, they know that, that if, they, if they lose a vehicle, if they hurt somebody, if they damage things, it is not good for their bottom line. So whether that's ethical standards or just a smart business sense, you know, I'd like to think that it's a combination of both. Um, because I don't think people inherently, you know, try to damage the environment or, or hurt anybody in, in their operations. In, you know, they don't set out to do that necessarily. I don't, you know, I don't really believe in the big bad corporate America. So I don't, I don't you know, I, I think they're very cognizant of, you know, their actions in space or, or even getting to space and understanding that they could be very quickly, not only them, but the entire thing could be shut down. Um, and then, you know, we'd have to wait another couple of decades to, to try again. So, you know, I think there's some, there's some forethought there. Mariba. So I think this is where capacity building and technology exactly. sharing makes a big deal. When you have a couple of countries or a couple of entities that are at the technological forefront and you say, we're not going to share any of this knowledge with anybody, we know how to maneuver our satellites to the millimeter precision. We have this, we have all these cool things. But then you have some country, I don't know, Amberland in, in, on some other continent that is just getting involved in space and they have no access to best standards, best practices, this sort of stuff. We can't say, well, you know, if you don't have this technology, you don't belong in space, but we're not gonna share, we're not gonna. So we're only as safe as the most uh, ignorant space actor. Okay, and, 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 and like, like you know, Sonia said, I wouldn't you know, assign culpability and, and, and malintent, uh, but we need to provide, as a global community, some sort of foundational level of knowledge to ensure that the people that do go to space have kind of the best sort of practices and, and, and the b most kind of equal playing ground in terms of safety and sustainability to help that domain be able to thrive. And that's what the long-term sustainability guidelines were put in motion to address. And, and actually, I was looking at them because one of my classes is working with some of them, and we're going to talk about that in class tomorrow. So I was kind of brushing up and looking at what guidelines. That's not have a hint already at all, made. <laughs> yeah, What <laughs> guidelines we've made, you know, are, are finalized. Which we, so I was looking at them to see what they covered, and they really sort of are almost like if you were going to say what what would be the right thing to do in space, they would be the ethical guidelines. So they're they're not f imposed or hard law, but they're still there to provide a guide and a lot of them deal with this idea of if you know how share it with those that don't there's a whole lot of capacity building and data sharing and 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 this this idea that perhaps your interest is not for the great greater good of all but in your own self interest you know there's several levels you can you know you can have this altruistic high level which i like to believe that's where i live and then of course you have this more basic level which might be for self interest which in itself though yeah. it, it it is more sustaining than to not think at all and so you want to make sure that people understand the issues i like to believe that that's what our program does by even including some of these courses as core courses let's come over here Good evening. Thank you for being with us. Your name and your field of study. My name is Nicholas Van Riper, and I'm studying spaceflight operations. And my question is, uh, with uh, big players like Elon Musk stating they want to send astronauts to uh, you know, Mars and beyond, you know, 100 plus at a time, where are these applicants going to be coming from, and what are some of their skill sets going to be? Great question. Yeah, I mean, uh I can't, I can't speak to what Elon's list of uh, 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 skill sets are, but he, here's the thing, right? I mean, he seems like he's a pretty sharp guy. Uh, he probably wants to be successful, so he's probably not gonna take people that, that, that um, don't know how to do some good engineering and some good science, and, and he's probably not gonna take people that, uh, uh, here's the deal, right? When you look at games like Survivor and that sort of mm -hmm. stuff, and, the producers of Survivor, if you're watching this, forgive me, but my guess is that when they put together the list of people 
they're not looking for the for a group of people that's going to get along with each other. All right? They're not Yeah, cuz yeah. cuz we like seeing this kind of chaos kind of mm -hmm. stuff on TV, right? So my guess is that you want to really be selective, do psychological profiles. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like it's probably a similar skill set to people that go to Antarctica, right? I mean, you can't just go to Antarctica and spend a year. You have to go through a series of tests and that sort of stuff before they put you in isolation at the South Pole. I have, you know, two of my best friends did that. And they said it was pretty rigorous. My guess is that it's going to be a similar process uh, uh, to send people there. Jim Cameron is a member of the Chamber of Commerce here, where some of these folks, including the Chamber, made that trip to see about Shiloh. Jim, thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you, Mark. Great discussion tonight. Very much enjoying it, though. But uh, ever since, you know, I mean, the space shuttle light stopped several years ago, though, and you mentioned a minute ago somebody was talking about hitch and ride with the Russians and all like that, carrying individuals up into space. Commercial space, companies like SpaceX or maybe perhaps Blue Origin, how, how long will it be before we perhaps start seeing men and women going up into space again, perhaps down here from the Cape? Maybe next year. That's what that, that's what Ariane. Uh, yeah, yeah. For, yeah, right. For, next, for, for, next, next year, year. two thousand nineteen. Right. Next year. Wow. You know, it, it's and you know, and and some of the questions that have come up from my students in the past have been, you know, well, how safe do we think that the commercial industry is going to be? And you know, and that's a very valid concern. And you know, just like my previous comment, you know, those those companies are obviously very concerned about that as well. You know, but I don't think that there's any you know, that there's any reason to believe that, that the commercial industry can't do it as well as, as the government. And we've already seen the government stumble a couple of times. So, you know, it, it's still hard, it's still difficult, you know, we're, you know, and, we, and unfortunately we have accidents in aviation and we've been doing that for 100 plus years. So it will never be perfect, but it, you know, I, I think that these companies know what they're doing and they're being very cautious. And that's why you kind of see delays along the way because they're trying to make darn sure that they're going to do it the right way. Yeah, I mean, so, so one thing I want to add to that is that I think as a society we've become um, very risk averse oh, yes. in, in, in a way. And um, if you look back throughout history when it comes to exploration, people recognize, hey, this may be a one-way trip. Bad things can happen. Bad things happened frequently, they happen often, but success came on the piggybacks of these kind of mishaps and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. I think if we really want to be a space-faring kind of uh, species and, and go to other mm -hmm. places, to some extent we're going to have to accept a little bit more risk in terms of uh, the, the probability of, of casualties and this sort of stuff. And, and I know that that might, might sound morbid, but, but if you try to guarantee uh, with 100% probability that there will be no loss of life, we're not leaving the planet. Uh, we shouldn't even leave our homes. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, exactly. We wouldn't drive. Right, right, right. We wouldn't yeah, drive our right. cars. Sure, you Let's drive. come over here. Uh, we have a few questions left. Good evening. Right into the microphone, your name I'm and your field of study. I'm an interdisciplinary major. And I was wondering, how would regulation work with maintaining the value of on-surface precious metals rather than importing them from asteroids? That comes back to the harvesting of, oh, yeah. of yeah. minerals so from I'm asteroids. Well, sure. yeah, I, th I think I can kind of frame the question. It's, it's more about um, you know, the su supply and demand. If now we're, you know, now the precious metals that we're looking to bring from asteroids down to Earth, you know, that, so the prices are high here on Earth. We're going to go out to asteroids right. and we're going to bring them back. How do we, you know, how do we sort of normalize the, the, the price, the market, and make sure that we, put, we don't put the earthbound companies out of business? Um, I've had that question in my class a couple of times, and I honestly don't have a good answer for you. Um, you know, I think it's going to be one of those things potentially that, you know, it, it's just the market's just going to change. You know, like, you know, and we've seen this with Space Launch, you know, for a long, long time. It was $10,000 a pound plus to put something in orbit, and now it's not. So now all these companies are scrambling. It's just going to be another disruptor. And, and those companies that are Earth-based are, are going to have to, are going to, have to adapt <laughs> in some way, shape, or form. So, I, you know, that's, that's the best answer I can give you. So <laughs> right point. now it's sort of open-ended. Yeah. Over here, Miss, your question. My name is Jana Tagenhorst, and I'm a freshman here studying aerospace engineering. If the first mic into the microphone, if you could. Sorry, closer. <laughs> thank yeah. you. Um, first of all, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight and talking to us about commercial space race. But 
Specifically, I wanted to talk about this idea of non-sovereignty that was established in the Outer Space Treaty in 1967. I have also read that it's been compared to the Antarctic, uh, Antarctic Treaty System, and from that research, I've also found that there was a case in 2004 between Australia, the Humane Society International, and Japan, but more specific, specifically a Japanese whaling company, and that there was still conflict even though there was this idea of non-sovereignty. Um, do you think the same thing could happen even though we have this idea of non-sovereignty in space, specifically with the United States, UAE, and Luxembourg, even though they have all come out with their own domestic laws on what it means to have that non-sovereignty but also be able to claim those resources and utilize those resources? Well, first of all, um, th there's a, a, a little bit of a difference between Antarctica <coughs> and outer space, but you're right. They were both actually, um, the Outer Space Treaty was negotiated uh, during the same time frame that the Antarctica Treaty was, and, and many of the same people were working on both of them at the same time. Um, but remember, Antarctica is quite small. It's a very fixed location. Outer space is quite large. So Antarctica is what we call res nullius. It belongs to no one. So when you're talking about non-sovereignty, that's what you're talking about. That's different than what we have in outer space. That's res communis. It belongs to all of us. So it's a little bit different. It means that everybody, everybody has a right to be there as opposed to we do, but only as far as you know, your hand and then you, you, as long as you don't interfere with somebody else when they have their hand outstretched. So it's a little bit different. What's gonna happen, it, we don't know, but we most likely will rely on diplomatic channels to try to figure it out. And that's why it's so important that as, these, as countries are putting laws on their books that say, okay, it's gonna be okay, finding some way to do it so that there's a, a mechanism to work out disputes like that mm -hmm ahead of time. But it, it doesn't mean, it, of course there's disputes, and even when you have a situation when there is no sovereignty, people will, will uh, question what their rights and their responsibilities are, and they'll go to courts to ask them to, to uh, figure it out. That will likely happen. But that doesn't mean that we don't do these activities. It just means that we, we do them, and we do them hopefully in good faith. We've yeah. talked about yes. ethics and whether, you know, where they come from. And, and understanding that the issue with space is that, it, that we all have the right to be there, ultimately, at the end of the day. Got a quick question here. Based on the participants now in commercial space, are participants barred from putting weaponry in space that may be in the commercial area? In other words, could China, could the United States insert weapons that are permanently there aimed at somebody? No nuclear weapons, no weapons of mass destruction. Okay. Over here. Your question now. We've got just a couple of minutes left. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, my name is Haley Lewis, and I'm a senior in the Space Flight Operations degree program. Um, my question for you all is kind of more um, asking your opinion or your perceptions on uh, the developing commercial industries that are not led by millionaires or are not considered big space. Um, right now there's a lot of discussion of um, like developing technologies, but you come and see these space startup communities, they go for VC funding and then they kind of ebb and flow and come and go. When do you think that industry will kind of calm down and become normalized? Mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, so, you know, these days when I go to a conference, it's like, it's hard to meet somebody who's not a CEO of a company of one. Um, so, so no, so, so, so I get it. Um, I, think, I think that'll become normalized as uh, you get some people that have successes uh, in, in, in the market, are able to get things on orbit, are able to test out some of these technologies. I think right now there's so much buzz because there's still so much potential and there's, and there's so many things that haven't occurred yet, but as things start actually happening, I think you're going to start seeing kind of the natural tendency of, of the dust to settle, uh, if you will. Well, and, and you know, I, I agree in part. <laughs> I agree in part. Um, you know, it's gone from, a, space has gone from, you know, large companies doing it with lots and lots of money um, and, and typically government contracts to small business. But you also have to look at the economy as a, as a whole in the U.S. And the backbone of the American economy is not you know, Boeing and Lockheed Martin and so on, it's small business. You know, companies that are less than, typically less than about 500 people. A lot of companies, especially with the internet, you see people f working from home and, and making a living from home just on their own. You know, I think that's a tremendous thing. You know, I think 
The, the really cool thing about you know, SpaceX and these companies making space you know, cheap, <laughs> I, don't, I don't really like to use that word, but you know, less expensive is that now it does open up opportunities for, for people, you know, real people, not just these big companies, to do these types of things. So, so maybe we'll have lots of these you know, companies and individuals do a lot of things. Maybe they'll want to just do it and then sell their company. Um, you know, that's one strategy that Lockheed Martin does is, you know, they innovate by buying small businesses and things like that. <laughs> so it may never stabilize, but that's kind of what makes it exciting too. Um, but the fact that it's opened up to, you know, to sort of the common man, so to speak, um, and the common innovator and researcher at the university and so on, without having hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars is, that's the exciting part. That's the exciting part. So now you can work on, you can work on your NanoSat and, you know, and, and have it launched. And you know, that's, not, that's not some wild dream anymore. You, we even have kids in elementary schools putting together NanoSats with some help and then you know, launching, launching experiments into orbit. That's cool. That's, but if you do that, cool. make sure it's trackable. Okay? Yeah, make sure. <laughs> and then you have a different, you know, you have a, you have a disposal yeah. plan. <laughs> we'll take one more question from the audience, and then we'll wrap tonight. Good evening, and thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you very much for being here. So I'm John Galjanic. I'm a junior in aerospace engineering. And uh, I'm sorry if this was asked and answered before, but um, is it legal under current law uh, the, that if there is a space outpost of some kind, like we keep discussing, that the establishing company might be the local law enforcement there? Could you say the, the last part of that again? Oh, would it be legal that the, the company that would establish a space outpost would then be the governing body, the local law enforcement administration, et cetera? Again, it depends. So you, under, under the current treaty regime, you can have an outpost. You can have an installation. Um, there are certain um, things that go along with that. So if uh, another country wants to inspect it, they, you, you need to, if they are a party to the Outer Space Treaty, you need to allow that as long as they give you reasonable notice of, for time and, and that you don't have to you know, give away your, your national secrets and do anything like that. And, and it, uh, again, it can't be a, mi a military installation unless it's for mil it, it can be a military installation if it's for research, but not if it's actually for, for military purposes. So, so those things are allowed. And... I, I can't see any reason why those that I mean <coughs> that will continue. I mean a lot of the work I mentioned earlier about the Moon Village Association and and some of the work that's being done it's 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 not pie in the sky. There's you know there's a, an effort to be made to figure out what kinds of governance rules should be put in place, how to involve um, other all the different countries um, and give them a say in, in what kind of governance, what kind of law enforcement, what kind of what kind of um, norms are going to be employed with a agreement from all of those that are involved. Well, so that'll happen. And, and it won't be done in a vacuum either. No. You know, as, as we've said before, you know, the Outer Space Treaty was you know, in part with the uh, Antarctic Treaty and so on. This, the, it, it all builds on each other. So you can look back at maritime law and you can see relationships to aviation law and then you can see relationships to space law. And it, it will probably progress along that in, you know, assuming that, all the, you know, that it makes sense for those types of things and that everybody agrees. You can even find the the preparatory work that, uh, like the legislative history for some of those mm -hmm. older documents and even things that are going on now. Transcripts of um, the work that's been done for long-term sustainability are available on the uh, USA website, the uh, Outer Office of Outer Space Affairs, but also you can go back in and you can find the Travaux Prepatois, the legislative history of things like the Outer Space Treaty. And I'm certain, I, I know our, um, my wheelhouse pretty well, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that if you went into the, the uh, Law of the Sea and, and you looked to see if there was Travaux Prepatois about some of those things, you would find them as well. So it is transparent. It's like a public record. And you can see it evolve. We've got one final question back up in the booth. Here's Alan. A uh, question is from David Massey. The re race to the moon had a unifying effect for the U.S. and a polarizing effect with respect to the USSR. What effect will the new commercial space race have on geopolitics or cul cultural relations? <laughs> to be continued next Ooh. week. <laughs> That's a big question. Who wants to field it? We're running out of time. Well, I can say this, right? Um, there are people in other countries that um, feel that it's not the place of the U.S. to just grant carte blanche to U.S. companies to do whatever they want, especially with the mining and that sort of stuff. And that sort of thing 
creates a bit of animosity. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's yeah. definitely some huge implications there's tension. There. Oh, it's, well, it's very complicated, obviously, and, and now we're, we're dealing in a global economy. So I, I think, you know, you have to think about it from the, from the global aspect of what it will do uh, for trade and, and that sort of thing. But, you know, we're certainly going to see more and more U.S. space systems being launched. There's several proposed, especially, you know, global Internet, um, you know, space-based Internet systems and so forth. So it, it's coming. Um, but then you also see other companies that have provided, you know, and helped, you know, make other countries space capable so that, you know, they didn't launch the satellite, but maybe they bought it or they're buying time on the satellite. So they, they are, you know, benefiting from the work that our, that our companies are doing. Oh, there's so many people that put this thing together. I pray I don't forget anyone. Uh, the voice of judgment in the booth is Alan Marcus Pinto Caesar. How do you get your name on an ID bracelet? That's what I want to know. Also, Sarah Withgow and Melanie Siwik Assam, who put these together. I probably mispronounced your last name too, Assam. Uh, also, Bob Score, David Massey, Bill. And thank you so much for having the faith to let me play in this sandbox, uh, along with uh, Tony Petro, Justin Bungard. And you can learn more by going to the website, www.lift. Uh, .erau.edu, and we also want to thank the people who made this possible, your generous contributions to Embry-Riddle to help us to fulfill the university's mission, educating the, the next generation of aviation and aerospace leaders. Giving to, er, uh, dot, giving to .erau.edu, without your generous contributions, these things would not be possible, and these people would not be progressing in their education. I want to thank our panel once again, Diane Howard, along with uh, Marie Baja and um, also uh, Sonia McMullen. Two of you flew in to do this, and we appreciate you giving up time from your families to come to be with us as well. Before you part, we want to tell you what we're going to do when we come back in one week. One last event for the spring series, Lieutenant Colonel Danny McKnight, retired United States Army. He will be here for Veterans Appreciation Day. For those of you in the audience who are veterans, you'll be getting your invitations. It is open. Embry-Riddle salute from the President's office to all veterans. It's an annual event here at Embry-Riddle. Begins at, I believe, 11.30, and that is followed by, for the veterans, uh, a catered lunch. And then Colonel McKnight will be with us in the evening to talk about his book, and you're all invited to come back for that free and open to the public here on the campus of Embry-Riddle. Once again, our panel tonight for commercial space. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for being with us. Have a very pleasant good evening.